Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. For those that don't know me, I'm Jo Symes and I run the Progressive Education website and social media platforms. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our panellists today who will be talking about the impact that student collaboration and democratic education can have in the classroom. So we've got Derry Hannam, who's in the UK like me, Richard Fransham, who's joining us from Canada, Charlie Moreno Romero, who's in Estonia, and Geraldine Rowe, who's also in the UK. So each panellist will have about 15 minutes to share their experiences. And then at the end, hopefully we'll have some time for some questions. If you do have questions, you can just put them in the comments, which should be just right under the video that you can see. Um, one thing I do need to mention is that because we're streaming from a platform called StreamYard, it means we can't actually see all of your names if you do put your, you do make some comments. So um, if you want us to know who you are, there should be a link. So there should be a description above this video. And then at, at the end of that, it should say, I'm using StreamYard. And then there should be a link that you can follow and then we'll know who you are. So, right, let's get started. So we're going to come to Derry, first of all. So Derry has been a teacher, he's been a head of department and a deputy head and an Ofsted inspector. He's also carried out research into democratic citizenship and he's the author of the book, Another Way is Possible, Becoming a Democratic Teacher in a State School. Okay, well, thanks, Joe. I'll start with um, perhaps a slightly depressing comment because the lovely person who made it is in real trouble right now. This was the Ukrainian Minister of Education who I met when we were at a conference in Ukraine a couple of years ago. Um, and she said to me, um, the trouble with the Ukrainian school system is um, the kids are like stuffed fish. They look like fish, but they can't swim. In other words, they've learned loads and loads of content which they've regurgitated in tests, but they can't make use of it. It looks like a fish, but it can't swim. And at the same time, the young Scottish writer of the year um, wrote about her experiences of school. There's no love in learning anymore. I know less about myself and who and what I could be than when I started at school. The curriculum must release its chokehold on the throats of the nation's kids. A comment from me. Um, I once said at a conference in Denmark that learning about democracy and human rights when I was at school was like reading holiday brochures in prison. And another one, you'll never learn to swim if you're not allowed in the water. And of course, all the soft skills that employers are crying out for now require experiential learning. You can't instruct these soft, soft schools They've got to be learned in the everyday life of the relationships of the school. So what I really want to talk about is my experience as a class teacher of trying to introduce self-directed education, self-directed learning, plus democracy, plus human rights to create that magic optimum learning situation. I've no time here to discuss democratic schools and what Charlie and Geraldine and Richard and myself have all got in common is our work has been in state schools, in the public school system, not in the English sense. Um, so how do we begin to listen to the kids and take their concerns, interests, passions and questions seriously? Well, what we don't do, it seems to me, is have Putinist Putin-esque authoritarian schools that talk about democracy, but nobody learns how to do it. Dewey said that authoritarian schools teach obedience or rebellion, whatever they say they do, neither of which helps you to be a creative person in society. And of course, authoritarian schools model hierarchical power and its abuse. Well, as a student teacher, I discovered A.S. Neal and Summerhill as an antidote to the behavior management course that I was expected to do at the teacher's college, learning about Skinner and, uh, and rats pushing pellets to, to get food pallets, um, Pavlov and his salivating dogs. And I sort of skipped all the uh, behavior management classes and went to the library and read books by Dewey and Neil, et cetera, et cetera. And I had two wonderful teaching practices in primary schools where I tried out the self-directed learning approach with a class meeting 
and the students choosing what they do, getting the parents involved. And the head teacher, of course, when the parents were happy, the head teacher was happy. I was very lucky with my primary school experiences to have this opportunity. But I had a disastrous experience in a secondary school, which I'll tell you more about if I have time at the end, which made me feel I'm going to have to be a primary school teacher. Um, well, why did I try it? Human rights seem to me we've got to genuinely respect the rights of children in the school, even though when I was doing this was before Article 12 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. It seemed to me I hated school and that if school was going to improve, you needed to listen to the kids. And if you did, you'd improve the physical and the psychological environment. You'd also get more effective learning, I thought. You'd get a kind of benign cycle of participation, choice, ownership, interest, engagement, agency, self-evaluation, resilience, success, self-esteem, motivation, deep learning, etc., etc., etc. You get a kind of benign spiral. And I met Jerome Bruner at this time, and he talked about his four C's of childhoods, similar to Peter Gray and Ken Robinson, that we need to take into account. Kids are curious. They love to collaborate. They love to play with each other. They love to communicate, and they love to become competent. So I thought, We've got to create classrooms that make this possible. And as I said, some things can only be learned experientially, in my, in my opinion. How to, be, how to do democracy, how to be responsible. You learn to be responsible through taking responsibility. That means you have to have some freedom to make mistakes. Moral values, you learn about morality through making difficult decisions and being responsible for them. Justice and the rule of law, the entrepreneurial spirit. I've got nothing against entrepreneurialism, whether it's social or economic. Also, I thought if we could create this kind of participative environment, it would make relationships between students and students and students and adults become based on trust and that this leads to well-being rather than being just based on authority. We want an atmosphere where everyone matters. And of course, my real reason for doing it was, I have to admit, it's more fun. If you can have fun in the classroom, you reduce stress and anxiety, you improve stimulation, and of course, you improve learning. And this is all directly connected to well-being and mental health. One other reason, it seems to me that child protection, if you have an open classroom where everybody can speak their mind, the chances of kids end up being abused in school by other kids or by adults becomes infinitesimally small. So what I did in my first job, I had this amazing opportunity. I got a job in a secondary school as a class teacher of integrated humanities. The head was trying to replicate mm -hmm. some of the experiences of the primary school in the first year of secondary school because it was a secondary modern school. And these kids had just been put through the disastrous experience of the 11 plus exam. Um, and I had 34 of them, a nice big classroom, 60% uh, of curriculum time to teach history, geography, RE, social studies, English, and whatever the other one was. Perhaps that was all of them. 60% um, of the week. And we were in a team. There were seven of us. It was seven form entry. And we had our own suite of classrooms. We had three things that I think are terribly important. Territory, team, time, 60% of the curriculum. And something's going ting. Oh, well, anyway, my three T's are team, time, and territory. Um, so I had my class on the first day, 34 kids, in they came, not knowing what to expect. We sat in a circle and I explained to them that what the five subjects were. English, how people communicate. History, the past. Geography, how people live in different parts of the world. 
religious education, the things that people believe, and social studies, the way in which people organize their communities. And one lovely little boy called David interrupted me and said, I told them they could call me by my Christian name in the classroom, but not outside. He said to me, Derry, he said, testing if it was really possible. Derry, does that, that sounds like the whole world. Can we study the whole world? And I said, well, yeah, well, I suppose we can. Anyway, we elected a class chair. We elected a class secretary. We started making class rules. We ended up with a class court and elected judges. And as I said, we had about 60% of the week. And we ended up with about 15%. If you could say 5% is a one-hour period in a 20-period a week. We spent about three hours a week on meetings of all kinds, planning the curriculum, um, planning how we would run the school, planning trips, planning things we wanted to buy. And in the end, we created so many jobs in the class. Everyone had two or three jobs. And also, everyone had the chance to, to chair the school, the class meeting. I thought I'd get fired, probably. Um, but I didn't. It was rather interesting. What happened was the parents became terribly supportive because they saw their kids bringing their projects home and spending hours and hours studying all kinds of things. I said to the kids, you can either work on your own or if several of you are interested in the same subject, you can work on it together. So we had about 15% of time spent on the meetings, which were wonderful oracy opportunities. We had about 30% of curriculum time on these self-directed projects. And about 15% of time was spent on the work that the various heads of subject departments told me to do. And most of it went in the bin, but some of it was interesting and some of the kids did some of it. But I didn't feel very constrained to do everything that I'd been told to do. As I say, I ignored an awful lot of it. Um, it was really amazing some of the things... Uh, the kids said, it's not like school, it's more like real life, they said. And in fact, this is why I've written the book. Some people said, oh, it does sound interesting. You should write a book about it, Derry. And then as I started work on the book, some of these kids, 50 years later, began to get in touch with me. It was a really strange experience. And one of them remembered saying to some visitors, Mr. Hannum's a bit soft, and if we didn't have our own laws, it would be chaos in here. This is Andrew, who's actually written half a chapter in the book. He said, I actually remember saying that. I'm so embarrassed. Anyway, these kids are now 60 years old, and they're still a lot of the ones I'm in touch with looking back on that year. Um, they've helped me write the book. Some of them say the experience of being in the democratic class was life-defining. Well, in my second year, instead of getting fired, I got put in charge of the whole year eight humanities team. So I had a team of seven teachers all working in this democratic um, student led learning way. And we were all in the same corridor, all timetabled at the same time. So we more or less just used to leave our doors open. And if kids wanted to go to a presentation in another class, they could. If they wanted to go and talk to another teacher who was more knowledgeable about something they were interested in, they could. Um... Two minutes to go, Derry. Two minutes to go. I thought I thought my time was up. Anyway, it worked. I didn't get fired. As I say, I got put in charge of the whole year group the following year with tremendous parental support. The embarrassing bit was that some parents asked if their kids could be transferred into my class. That was a bit embarrassing. But we began to work together really, really well as a team. And in fact, some of the older heads of the big, powerful departments in the school, you know, like the English department, were a bit upset that we seemed to be going our own way and ignoring their curriculum. But anyway, the head teacher was delighted. We created a year eight parliament, which eventually became the school council. 
And after two years, I got headhunted by another large school, 2,000 student school up the road that had just built a brand new humanities building. So I only stayed there for two years. It's very exciting now to be in touch with quite a number of kids who were in that class all those years ago. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Derry. It's such an amazing story. We're going to come on to Richard now. So Richard is also a former teacher and a youth rights advocate. He's currently writing a three-part essay about the need for a paradigm shift in education. Um, and part one's actually just been uploaded to my website, so you can find it at progressiveeducation.org in the articles section. So I'm going to hand over to Richard now. Thanks, Joe, and, and Derry, too, for kicking this off. Uh, Derry and I have had similar experience in being able to experiment with democratic education within the existing public or, or state system. And uh, we've had similar results as, as um, you'll, you'll see or hear perhaps. Um, I had more flexibility than, than Derry did. Uh, and you'll see that in the nature of the program that I was able to run. Uh, one thing to, to keep in mind here that I, I think is really important uh, I did the program that I'm going to, going to describe to you uh, with a colleague, and uh, and then there's Derry who did what he did, and if you read his book, you'll you'll see that uh, other teachers on his staff uh, joined in. So the the idea that uh, teachers in the existing system can be far more democratic than maybe they're led to to perform. Uh, is really important. There are a lot of teachers in the system that would like to be doing things different. If only they could be unleashed, as Derry says, to be the pioneers of possibilities. So really important that way. The, uh, the program I ran had a, a different kind of start. Uh, the fellow teacher, it's Ashley Coventry, that I, I did the program with. And uh, he was um, doing the, the school yearbook. This is in a high school. Uh, a grade uh, seven to 12 school. And he was producing the, the yearbook as a, an extracurricular activity. I was the computer teacher and uh, I was involved in two extracurricular activities. That were, one was uh, to produce a, a school newsletter and the other was uh, as the advisor for a student newspaper. And this is just around the time that, that PageMaker was coming in. So we didn't have to do the the old fashioned cut and paste type of production, we could actually lay it up in, in PageMaker. And, and that's what brought Ashley and me together. We were doing the, this, uh, working on the, the projects together and it was extracurricular. So we had students that were supposed to be doing this with us, but as extracurricular, it meant that, that we weren't getting the, the time from them that we needed for such, uh, significant undertakings. Plus, the, the school had a, a policy at the time that, that a, a student got a sticker for every extracurricular activity they participated in. And we were finding that the, the students that we had doing the yearbook, they, they were uh, good students, very capable, but they were, they were sticker hunters. They, they were after those extrinsic rewards and trying to get as many stickers on their certificate at the end of the year as they possibly could. And, and so they didn't have time to do the production as much as we needed them to put into it. So Ashley and I were finding that we were doing too much of the work. It, was, it wasn't the learning experience that it was supposed to be. And uh, what we did was we, uh, we had a long discussion one day uh, and talked about Sudbury Valley School and and wouldn't it be great if we could just have kids during the day, never mind the extracurricular, but the whole day to work on these publications together. And when you, you really investigate the potential behind publications, uh, the whole world could open up there, as, as Derry mentioned with the, the subjects that he had to perform. You can think in terms of what can you do with print? And basically you can, uh, open up the whole world to the students. And so Ashley and I went to the principal and, and said uh, we had the proposal of, of basically a Sudbury Valley school. 
can can you just let us have a, a school within a school uh, and and we'll we'll run that and the the only requirement will be that that we get these publications done and then we'll just let learning unfold the way it, it happens and uh, the principal immediately said absolutely no way could I get this proposal through the school board first of all the the ministry requires that students take four mandated courses every semester and so your students have to take four mandated courses and so from there evolved this uh, model that we ended up with and uh, I, I just want to point out first of all that this principle that we ran into was one of the type of people that that Derry has uh, described and picking up the term from from Heather McTaggart's book, Overschooled and Undereducated, about um, responsible subversives. Our principal was a, a responsible subversive who really wanted to work with us. And he had been a, a head of the, the union at one point, and now he was an administrator, so he knew the system. And he said, basically, let's get this proposal as close to to freedom as we can possibly get within this existing system. And so that's, that's what evolved into this uh, program called CHIP. And um, what it was is uh, the students ended up with control over how they learned, but not what they learned. And so they were, were taken off the, the school bell. And that, uh, just for background, Larry Rosenstock, who's one of the uh, co-founders of the High Tech High Network of Charter Schools in the U.S. said that the, the formally scheduled school day is the greatest impediment to educational innovation. And what we ended up with after all the constraints were applied and, and as much freedom provided as possible is um, a group of, of 25 students mixed age from grades 10 to 12. And so we had them all day, this mixed age group of students, not as broad a mixed age as we had wanted, but at least uh, three grades of mixed age. And uh, we had them all day, so they stuck together as a, a community. And they had to do their four credits, but they were off of the school bell. And, and so they were the architects of their own learning. They could approach their courses as they pleased. and. Uh, so it became that the, the curriculum that we were dealing with was the skills of independent lifelong learning, not the, the curriculum as such, but they applied the, the skills of independent lifelong learning to their courses. So it was, we, we referred to it as um, the coursework was a, a byproduct of their, their real learning. And I refer to the, the project or the, the program as an accidental discovery because when all the constraints had been put on it, I, I was disinclined to actually go ahead with running the program. I was thinking that the, the constraints are such that the students are not going to be able to uh, accomplish the coursework and learn to do it independently all within the one semester that we had to run the program. And the, the real discovery here, the thing that, that uh, <coughs> has changed my approach to things is that uh, the, the students were more than able to accomplish their coursework in the time provided because they can be so focused and streamlined when they don't have to lockstep with everybody else in the class, when they don't have to uh, do assignments that they know are just busy work. And so they, they really concentrate on the learning that needs to be done and accomplishing those, those learning objectives. They had to write the same final exams as other students, so there was some comparative there as to uh, how they were doing. And uh, that was all within this um, democratic environment we, we set it up that uh, the teachers were, were in there as um, co-learners, co-teachers, um, 
practicing democracy together. We had a, a judicial committee. And one thing that that became apparent immediately is that as soon as you flatten that classroom hierarchy, the discipline problems go away. The, the problems of discipline uh, are the result of, of the power imbalance and, and students feeling powerless in the process. We had no discipline problems. There was um, no one to argue with. We, we dealt with differences together and they weren't very much. And when they did happen, they, they could usually be handled with just um, simple discussions, not even with the teachers, but with other students. So the, the climate changes completely. I don't know how my time's doing there, Joe. It's, I could talk for hours on this, a couple of things I'd like to put in. You've got and about five minutes left. About five minutes? Yeah. So the, um, the thing that I, I learned here that became really valuable is that that we can create programs and, and dairy's proof of it too where we can substantially move towards democratic education even within the existing systems with all their constraints it's um, a teacher uh, decision uh, teacher behavior the, these things can be changed and when you have principals like like we had who are uh, uh, inclined to empower teachers to pursue the possibilities, uh, it's amazing what can be accomplished. And so having that, and, and this is why I call it accidental discovery program, basically having the, the courses imposed on the students where they had to study the mandated curriculum actually fits well within what Daniel Pink in his book Drive described as the, the kind of scaffolding that you need in order to help people move from highly controlled environments to ones of um, a lot of autonomy. The, those courses grounded the students in something that they knew and they were able to attack them then and feel comfortable and their parents felt comfortable that the, the students were not getting behind in some way. Uh, it, it locked things in enough to the old way of doing things that we could break boundaries in other ways. They got through the coursework in no time. They were learning the skills of self-directed learning and they were accomplishing the, the learning requirements that they needed in order to graduate with their friends. So there was none of that pushback that you might get otherwise, which was to the credit of the, the principal who helped us get the program going. When it comes to the the skills of self-directed learning. Uh, it's um, the one that we, we most focused on was analytical reading. The college, local college at the time required students to take an analytical reading course because they found they were graduating from high school not knowing how to, to read properly. And the, the reading, analytical reading is described as the ability to, to read a manual we defined the, the math textbook as the student's manual and declared that we're not going to teach you math. Uh, we'll teach you reading if, if you need reading. And we told them this story about the, the college. And so um, learn to teach yourself math. You have a, a good manual there. But if you run into problems, come to us with your, your textbook and we'll give you a reading lesson. We'll see where, where it is that you don't have enough mental agility to see things from the angle that the, the authors are looking at it from. And so we, we challenge them to up their, their game that way. And, and that, not that just by itself. We, we also said there are many other resources that you can use other than teachers to, to learn the math that you need to learn. And the classroom, we had two two basic requirements for students to get into the course. One was uh, that they had to be coming to school to learn. We didn't want people taking this course thinking that this is a nice way to goof off. And, and so they had to agree to that. And then secondly, that they would uh, help us to create a, a community of learners. And uh, so the, uh, beyond that also, 
uh, the idea of, of the math and the resources that it wasn't just a case of anal analytical reading. It was a case of everybody in the class, uh, how could they be a resource to you? And then beyond the class, parents and, and uh, neighbors, whoever, you, you look for the resources that can help you accomplish the learning that you, you want to undertake. Uh, I'm rushing now, shortness of time always. Um, the um, integration of subjects was possible here and also the involvement of other ages. So the, the students had to work on uh, math, computer, English, and um, what's the other one? English, math, computers. I'm forgetting the, the fourth one. Oh, no, it'll come to me anyway. The, um, the students in, in one grade had to uh, read Macbeth. And rather than just sit down and read it, they decided they were going to produce it. And so they, they created the, the show, the play Macbeth. Uh, and, and so that became their English course. They videotaped it and, and created a production about it, which was uh, the, uh, the technical side, the computer side. The other one that I was forgetting was, was art. They had, a, had to get an art credit as well. And so creating all the props and backdrops for their play uh, allowed them to work towards their art credit. And then you have with, with math, uh, creating anything, uh, construction, you're dealing with math. And so they, they could incorporate the learning of their courses together and tick off what some of the learning requirements uh, were just from being able to do that together in a really uh, healthy way uh, and a fun way for them, relationship building that's important. I think just one last thing. Uh, two of the older boys, grade 12, uh, confessed to me after being in the course for about six weeks that of those two criteria, uh, they, they were coming to school to learn, but they weren't going to have anything to do with this idea of building community. They just wanted to work on computers together. And they said they didn't want to have anything to do with the little grade 10 kids. And so you get that age discrimination that our current system tends to, to foster or breed and six weeks into the program, they came and confessed it to me that, that they had come into the program not thinking they were going to help build community. But they, they said at that point that we don't even notice the age difference anymore because they'd been living together in community and uh, uh, they became family. I could say an awful lot about that, but I think uh, with time... Uh, I'll leave it there except one last thing. My uh, co-teacher, Ashley, said at one time we were looking in on the class together, seeing the, the activity that was there, and his comment was, have you noticed that the more we step back, the more they step forward? And that really, in many ways, sums up what that experience was, that we have got to back off and let let the kids um, come forward. How's that, Joel? Good enough? Perfect. Thank you so much. That's so interesting. Just um, there's a comment here. Someone's just said, how ironic that the hierarchy that claims to create order and discipline creates discipline problems. Um, yeah, so yes. cool. It's true, though. Absolutely. Yeah. And it robs, robs kids of uh, learning to to deal with their own problems, how to how to problem solve real life issues. Absolutely. Teachers come in and, and uh, declare what the solution will be. You're going to do this and you stop doing that. It doesn't work. Hmm. OK, thank you, Richard. Um, moving on to Charlie now. So Charlie's going to talk about his current role as head of studies and how he's managed to set up a democratic school within a state school in Estonia. Thank you very much, Joe. It's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Charlie Moreno Romero. I'm, I'm the head of studies of SUBEMAE, which uh, not by coincidence, it is called SUBEMAE, the Estonian translation to Summerhill, because it was uh, an inspiration. And uh, it is a pilot project 
It's a democratic school within a public school. Uh, we are located in Tallinn and we serve around 70 kids at the moment. Um, let me just uh, share with you a couple of reflections. The first one would be that education is not necessarily schooling or school as we know it. Um, that uh, learning is one thing that does not uh, depend on teaching. Uh, adults tend to love teaching. We tend to love teaching, but we need to focus more on learning and how learning happens. Um, and I will be just briefly mentioning something about that. Uh, and the other one is that uh, teachers can be those people who accompany learning rather than being authoritarian figures or authority figures. My perspective is from anthropology, from education, education for social justice, and also democratic education. Um, and just briefly, I would like to share which uh, for me are the four characteristics of democratic education. On the one hand, we are talking about self-directed learning. I see it as a development of uh, self-determination de theory together with uh, learning to learn practice, uh, ending up in self-directed learning. Um, then we have age mixing environments to produce exactly what Derry and Richard was, where we're talking about scaffolding, the development of empathy, uh, the development of curiosity, of creativity um, uh, among ages. Then you have uh, free play, especially for younger kids, but in general, free play as a learning evolutionary um, a tool for learning. And then we have uh, shared decision making, the participation of young people in um, the, how the school is run, how the learning actually happens. At Subemai, as I was telling you, we have 70 kids. This is our third year of a pilot project. We have uh, Russian speaking kids, um, kids who speak uh, different languages at home and also Estonian uh, speaking kids. We speak three languages at school. Sometimes it's a bit challenging, but still, you know, the kids are brave enough as to help us, people like me who don't speak Russian, to understand and communicate with others who might not speak Estonian or English. Um, and we have promoted this, uh, uh, this aspect of shared decision making um, at different levels, but let me share with you two of them. Uh, one is in the creation, organization of uh, learning possibilities, learning uh, arrangements in which kids have um, a very active role. We have uh, designed a system in which we adapt to the learning style instead of asking the kids to adapt to our teaching style. And we are focusing exactly on the development of those learning to learn skills. Uh, in research projects, which usually happen at the gymnasium level, we start working on those uh, since the fifth class. Uh, the kids, um, together with the coaches, with the adults, um, revise the curriculum. We analyze what topics are of interest. We connect them to the kids' interest, and then we start a process of getting in depth into those topics, according to the kids. Let's say we are learning about history. Why not to learn about the history of circus? And then we go through different scenarios, historical scenarios of how that circus happens. The same with the human sciences, the same even with chemistry. We have semi-structured lessons on chemistry, but at the same time, we are promoting a perspective in which this is a practical learning. Kids have also a saying in how we, we are going to approach that. They develop their own experiments. They come with ideas of, hey, let's do this, let's do that. I would like, today I made a beautiful picture of, of uh, kids uh, around nine years of age who build um, uh, this balloon and they wanted to make it fly. Actually, it, it just flew like uh, just 20, 30 centimeters. They were so happy it fell down but the experience of building this stuff together, that was really powerful. So on the one hand, we are promoting this uh, youth participation in the academic arrangements, in learning about the world. Uh, and also we are promoting the participation of young people in uh, the arrangement of the school agreements and solving conflicts, which is a really interesting aspect, exactly what um, uh, Derry was mentioning. We need to practice democracy. We need to be already citizens within the areas uh, where we live in order for us to polish, to refine those skills. So we have a mediation committee with uh, young people and adults. We um, promote 
the adults actively uh, share with the kids the perspective of restorative justice, trying to uh, mend whatever damage was produced to uh, get to agreements instead of punishing. So this is really new for them as well. The fact that they participate in solving the conflicts instead of depending on uh, adult authority. Um, and well, why is this actually needed, required, desired at all, right? There is There, there are lots of, of different uh, research studies speaking about the benefits of uh, youth participation in decision making within pedagogical environments. I'm not going to get into those. I think Geraldine will, will share with us some of those aspects. What I would like to share with you is how, from a neuroscientific perspective, youth participation relates to the, ex the, de the development of executive functions and executive skills. When we are involving young people in designing the kind of learning at any sense, it doesn't have to be academic, the kind of learning they would like to uh, engage in, we are dealing with um, developing inhibitory mechanisms, self-control, patience, perseverance, uh, attentional control, nothing more interesting than having a discussion about what to do with cell phones in the school. The kids are connected, talking about it. They are listening to each other. They are expressing their viewpoints in, in very clear ways. They are considering different perspectives. This has to do with cognitive flexibility, with divergent thinking. Um, they are uh, uh, practicing reasoning skills. Um, what you are saying might not be actually coherent because of this, this, and that. Plus, if we have workshops like, uh, uh, you know, I have one of the most um, popular workshops, especially with the trouble kids, uh, is about philosophy. It's about thinking the world. So when we talk about logical fallacies and then we uh, read newspapers and, and start learning of how, oh, wait, this title actually might be a logical fallacy because of this, this, and that. They become critical thinkers. They are able to analyze also their own arguments. Um, one, of, one of the activities that we had was, okay, let's think about parents' uh, reasons for you not to do something or do something from their own lives. And then we were analyzing this, uh, this, uh, uh, critical fall this uh, logical fallacies um, in a really realistic way, in a, in a daily-based uh, uh, experience perspective. Um, what I can tell you is that this um, affects positively the way of involving young people into decision-making, to listen to them when they feel that actually they are listened to, affects them uh, positively at different levels. Um, you don't need to have a democratic school to uh, become a person who promotes democracy in your classroom. Um, when they understand that you are not there to judge them negatively, but rather you are a person who is with them considering different aspects of how life happens within that space or outside of the school, they can make uh, peace even with traumatic experiences. They recover their voice. When we participate together in a conflict resolution from a restorative justice perspective, kids who used to be bullies or used to bully or used to be bullied and intended to continue with that, those dynamics understand that the thing is not about revenge, that what we are trying to uh, build together is this school culture, this community uh, uh, feeling then they become active in helping others to solve conflicts. This has happened to us. Um, kids who were considered you know, problematic, every single teacher they have had had lost um, uh, faith on, on, on their ability to become um, proactive, positive citizens. They have reconnected with themselves. They have started asking questions. They start developing empathy, showing empathy to others. They start connecting with, what is it that I would like to do in my life? It is scary because we are speaking about two main aspects that I was pointing out in my PhD thesis. One of them is unlearning, how we break with patterns 
that have to do with transgenerational uh, authoritarianism, perhaps, or with our own schooling uh, experiences. So unlearning, reformulate, questioning actively that those patterns that we had learned, even at the university, how to stop using grades, how to engage in a collaborative assessment with them, how to decide together what are the assessment criteria for that project that you want to develop. When do you think that you have reached that, that you want to learn? Unlearning. And then um, in, in, in Spanish, it's really interesting term, desempoderamiento, which means releasing power. This has been um, uh, research, especially in uh, the Basque country, with um, the indigenous peoples of uh, Chiapas in Mexico, and how we start speaking about horizontal leadership, distributed leadership within uh, pedagogical environments, in which it is not one person, Charlie, who decides what will happen to the rest of, 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 the, um, of the servants of the place, uh, of, the, of the people who are working there, who are living their lives there. But it's actually we all listening to each other, trying to reach to, a, um, if not consensus, consent. There are different perspectives on uh, uh, shared decision making. There is the majority rule, there is sociocracy. Um, the important thing is that we can do this also within our classrooms. We can start empowering kids to start asking their own questions. Instead of answering our questions, let them ask their own questions. Let them understand what is it that they are not knowing and they would like to learn. This is truly individualization of learning. This is truly personalizing learning. And in the end, we have to ask ourselves, what can we do better than robots? Robots follow orders pretty well. What can we do better than those? I feel that we feel. I feel that we feel. We feel others. We feel for the people who are suffering, who are vulnerable. We feel for our communities. But I also feel about my future. By engaging young people in these processes, we allow them to be part of building a better future. As simple as that. I think that's enough from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlie. I feel quite emotional after that. That was so inspirational. Thank you. Um, I've got a question for you, but I guess I have to wait till the end. <laughs> so moving on to Geraldine then. Um, last but not least, um, Geraldine Rowe has over 40 years experience in education, both as a teacher and an educational psychologist. She's the author of a book called It's Our School, It's Our Time, which is based on her doctoral research. Good evening. It's uh, lovely to be invited to this, uh, this discussion. And I hope it does become a discussion uh, after we've spoken or spoken. Um, I'm just thinking, listening to, uh, to Richard, Charlie and, and Derry reminds me of a, a seminar I went to um, in the philosophy of education, where the speaker started off by saying, you can only have a philosophy of education if you have a philosophy of society. Um, and you have to know the kind of society you're looking for before you decide what school is going to look like. And I think uh, the, the previous speakers are really brought this to the fore, that the kind of society that this kind of education is aiming at is a society where decisions are made civic in a civic nature and people who are in, in affected by a decision are involved in the making of that decision. And we had to be reminded that um, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child made the involvement of all children of all ages in decisions that affect them um, a child's right. So no matter what the outcomes for uh, shared decision making in terms of behavioural learning, it's it's a, considered a good thing in, in its own right to make decisions, be involved in decisions that affect you. So I just want us to start with that because I think it, for me, it sets the, the backdrop to it. Um, and I come to it from a slightly different uh, background because as a psychologist, we tend to be involved in, in lifting up the bonnet to see what the workings, what workings are going on behind behavior and learning. And uh, my, my background started in a, in a degree in occupational psychology. So we were looking at theories of leadership and motivation at work and systems of organizations. 
And that became very important for me when I started as an educational psychologist because I was very aware of the theories in organizations um, that affected human behavior. And I saw schools in a very similar way as systems of leadership and that behavior was often driven by the culture of the school, both the behavior of teachers and the pupils. And I'm going to talk very specifically specifically about one particular aspect of progressive democratic education, which is collaborative decision making, or sometimes called shared decision making, um, which I kind of made the, made the focus of my, my own doctoral study. Um, when I was training to be an ed educational psychologist, I read a, an influential paper for me um, by O'Leary and O'Leary, which I can't find anymore, which um, showed that uh, if, if young children, uh, children and young adults were involved in monitoring and recording and assessing their own behavior, then any improvements in the behavior following this were maintained over time. Whereas if adults assessed and monitored the behavior, any changes as a result of being on report, that's what we call it in our schools, um, well, as soon as they came off report would pretty well disappear. So I, as one of my projects early on, um, replicated this by involving secondary school students, they were about 13 and 14 year olds, in monitoring and evaluating their own behavior and tracking their own behavior. And I found the same results. And what's more, I found the, the youngsters actually enjoyed um, monitoring themselves and they were much more honest, um, and I think, uh, hard on themselves than th their teachers would have been. And this was the, the first example um, way back when I was in my early 20s of really having a sort of uh, first hand response of in bringing the students into the process. I then went on, uh, after I trained to be an educational psychologist, um, you, you spend a lot of time in classrooms talking to teachers and children and parents about problems with learning and behavior and socialization and concentration. And um, occasionally I would just come into a classroom and find that there was something different going on. There was a level of engagement of the students and trust between the teachers and students and, and a blurring of roles between the teachers and students, which was sort of almost magical in, in outcomes. One example was um, uh, in a, uh, a nursery, which um, had just, uh, was having some visits from a, a four-year-old girl with Down syndrome. And uh, the teacher was involving the, the other young children in discussions about how to make her welcome and how to help her to settle into the class because she hadn't been at a nursery, um, as she hadn't started a nursery at the same time as the other children. And the ideas they came up with were, were really amazing. Um, I thought what was more amazing was that the teacher was bringing them into the conversation. But this, this little girl had a special chair because she had some physical attributes of, of finding it difficult to to stay sitting upright. And the children suggested that rather than have that chair, which is different to everybody else, that they get um, something like a large paper sample book. Uh, someone suggested they had one at home. And that would mean that the little girl could have her feet slightly higher off the ground and sit in ordinary chairs. Uh, they also didn't like the fact that this little girl had a beaker, a plastic beaker to drink out of and um, had a bib when it was time for eating and drinking. And, and they said, well, we, why does she have to have a plastic cup? And the teacher said, well, because she's very unsure about holding things and she might break a glass. And they agreed that actually they often dropped things and broke them and perhaps she should have the same opportunity to break things as they did. So <laughs> they also suggested she should have a napkin, not a bib. And these things were all implemented by the teacher. And it was it was just lovely how this is just one example of a lot of things going on in the classroom. Um, another another example was where um, uh, teachers in reception class 
ask the children, is there anything you can do for yourself that we do for you? And they said they could pour their own orange juice. But the adults were a bit worried they'd end up with pools of sticky orange juice all over the floor. But the, the youngsters came up with all sorts of implements that would help them, like toy watering cans and toy teapots. And they said if anything got spilled, they would help to clear it up. And they actually rather loved clearing up. It was quite funny to watch. But these, these little examples of how very young children involved in decision making around their own lives um, really showed me that it was something that the children really learned from and that the adults uh, really were, were telling me that they had really underestimated children's ability to do things for themselves and think for themselves. And once they started doing it, they couldn't stop. Once they saw children making decisions and, and uh, these decisions being better than the adults' ones, they wanted to do more and more of it. So when um, I became uh, very keen on, on pupil voice in my work and even running conferences on pupil voice for educational psychologists, so it became something that um, I think educational psychologists in this country uh, do a lot of anyway, writing reports in the first person to children and young people, for example, always involving them in, in the decisions and the, and the programs and the recommendations. It's, uh, it's quite a typical thing for the educational psychologists I've worked with to be doing. But when it came to a time when I wanted to do a doctorate, this was definitely going to be an area that I was wanting to pursue. Um, so I did my doctorate um, in UCL Institute, Institute of Education in London. And um, I did it on collaborative decision making. And I followed three teachers who were doing this in their classrooms, who had never received any training, but had developed a way of showing decision making with their pupils. And I followed these three teachers um, through classroom drop ins and in depth interviews for a year and a half and was able to discover what it was like to be a teacher who worked in this way. And I, I think I'll uh, hopefully answer some questions later on, but one of the biggest things I learned was that um, it wasn't as straightforward as it sounds to implement this in classrooms. There are so many aspects of school culture which actually fight collaboration um, work against collaboration than there are that work for it, that I decided to stop running um, workshops for teachers because I felt in the long run it might disadvantage them from what I'd found out from my, my research and really to aim at working with head teachers and school leaders because many stumbling block blocks came about not through the children, not through the parents, not through the learning, but through the, um, I suppose, um, clashes with colleagues and with some of the institutional structures and practices in the schools. So although these teachers were highly supported by their head teachers, the head teachers didn't really understand what was going on and didn't really understand what they needed themselves to change. And if you read Derry's book, uh, Another Way is Possible, I think you'll see that the, I think I'm right in saying, Derry, that you found that a big problem as well. How do you build bridges with colleagues in a school that is fundamentally based on external control and power differentials between the adults and the children? So I'm currently um, uh, being asked by schools to run workshops for teachers, and I I turn that down because I'm interested, if the head teachers aren't interested in working with me first, then I, I really think it's going to be a disadvantage for them to have a workshop just for, te for teachers. So a couple of schools are now uh, interested in doing it um, as a whole school approach. And I think that's really, really exciting. And um, I'm in touch with some people from around the world who are starting to do this a little bit. Um, and I think it's going to be a slow burning exercise, but hopefully one that will have uh, sustainability. And I'm really excited to um, 
to learn more about from these schools about how things have been going. I just, my last word is going to be on um, um, evidence bases, and I'm not going to go through a, a, a lecture. I, I will try and make an article um, in the near future on based on any questions people have about the evidence base. But in my book, what I say is that um, the, the the collection of monitoring and collection of data itself needs to be a collaborative venture between the adults and the young people in the school. And if teachers can start to, and, and, and the pupils, start to view their classrooms as sources of evidence for research and start to be researchers of their own practice, this is the best evidence you can hope for. So if, for example, a teacher decides to involve the pupils in decision-making about how they can improve I don't know, the spelling results of their class, take a simple one. Um, then the, the teacher can say, how will we evaluate whether this approach is better than what we were doing before? Involve the pupils in that, gather, help them to gather data and analyze that data together. And I've done this with, with four and five year olds. And if four and five year olds can do it, why can't 14 and 15 year olds? But it does appear that the higher up the school system you go in our country in particular, the less likely you are to be involved in decision making. And I think that's a real shame. I, I, I think talking to teachers, there is a great readiness for this, but they are in school structures that are, are cold nests for this practice. So we have to warm the nests up by working with the school leaders first. So uh, I, I welcome any questions that come. Um, look forward to your 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 queries and, and comments. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Geraldine. That's really exciting, actually. Um, you talking about the two schools taking a whole school approach to collaborative, I can't say it, <laughs> collaborative decision making. So, yeah, keep us posted as to how that goes. That's very exciting. <laughs> OK, so we have a few questions. <laughs> Sorry, coughing fit. Um, first of all, so if any teachers or school leaders are watching and they feel inspired to take some of your ideas forward, this is to all of you, um, what is one thing that they could do as a first step? Who would like to go first? Buy this book and buy Kerry, Terry, <laughs> Terry's book. <laughs> <laughs> We're into bookies. Yeah. I think the first step I would say would be um, for head teachers to say to their staff, um, are there any decisions that you would like more of a say in? Decisions that affect you. And likewise with the, the teachers, say to the class, are there any things I decide for you that you'd like more of a say in? Yeah, and, and often they are really simple things. Then they're they're they're, they're non-threatening things, um, but what's important to you know a class of twelve-year-olds may not necessarily strike their teacher or head teacher is important, and vice versa. Thank you, Charlie. I had a question for you. So you mentioned the concept of consent and sociocracy when you were talking. Could you elaborate a little bit about that? I'm not uh, an expert on sociocracy. I, I really like it. Um, if I if I may add one thing about the, the previous question, mm. um, definitely there should be um, a map of, of what could be better. I really like the proposal that uh, Barry advocates for, the 20% proposal um, coming from the 2016 Democracy and Education Conference was it conference uh, sponsored by the Council of Europe? Mm -hmm. uh, at least twenty percent of the timetable be devoted to the children, the young people, and also the adults' interest. I feel that that is a really important way to start empowering uh, the people within schools to start considering that as their space. Please, Barry. I was just going to chip in there about the, again about the last question. It seemed to me the responsibility of head teachers is to create the space where it's safe for younger teachers to be experimental and that they should offer support if the younger teachers get into difficulties, for example, with older, more established teachers. Um, I found that 
you know, I've worked for two or three head teachers and then actually become an acting head teacher for a while. And it can be quite a difficult balancing act. But, for example, to, if a head teacher decides to encourage all the staff in the school to allocate 20% of their curriculum time to the interests, purposes and questions of the young people, the head teacher should realise that might get some kickback from others who think this is a waste of time and the head teacher should come in and support there. I think the head teachers should encourage every teacher to introduce the idea of a class meeting in order to get the kind of processes that Geraldine's been talking about. There's no reason at all why every teacher tomorrow couldn't start to have a class meeting in their class, whatever their subject, whatever the age of the students to discuss how learning can be improved. And there's no reason at all why every teacher shouldn't allocate a proportion of their time, I suggest 20%, to the interests and concerns of the students. It could be, perhaps, for subject teachers in secondary schools, just interests within that subject. If they're lucky enough to work in an integrated situation where subjects work together, they have more choice. And of course, in the primary school, there, there's a great deal of choice. It was suggested to me the other day that every school should appoint a head of passion whose job it would be to tie together all these various opportunities that would arise in different parts of the school. It's rather a nice idea, head of passion. I would apply for that if I was a young teacher. Richard. Uh, Geraldine, I, I noticed that you had uh, referenced Glasser a couple of times in, in your book, a couple yes. of his works, and uh, one of his that I've, I've found really useful is this, uh, The Quality School, and uh, in there he addresses this problem of uh, the old and the new and the, the pushback that you get if you're a teacher trying to do something different in, the, in a school, and uh, he mentioned that if you have competing philosophies under the same roof, uh, you can find that one program tries to sabotage the other, uh, yes. which is uh, very much a reality, but uh, it only requires what what Derry was referring to, that head teacher that says, uh, we, we offer the students choice here, and, uh, and we don't try to influence their choice. We tell them uh, what the, the programs represent, and then they make the choice that, that is good for them. So if you're running something like a, a school within a school, like I was doing, that, that very much applies. And the principle that we had would be excellent at, at making sure that, that it was the students who were making their own decision and not being coerced by, by teachers one way or the other. The, um, the other thing just about giving students um, more choice, more say, uh, we have to be a little careful with that, uh, Derry. You you were with with what you did. You said that that uh, we'll work as a democracy in here as long as it works. But if it starts not to work, uh, I have the veto power, and I'm going to take back the power. I, I think I'm uh, reflecting that properly. And um, in the the program that I ran, uh, my colleague and I went in there on the basis of uh, complete equality. Uh, one person, one vote, and uh, we're just going to uh, deal with things together, which to me was was a mistake. We we didn't hold the veto power that that Derry did, and uh, and we found that it wasn't even necessary. You don't have to declare those things. You can just go in being equal with the students, and uh, and then see where it goes. So that there's there's no uh, there are no expectations raised about how much somebody's voice is going to be heard. We, we have to be careful within a, a structure as confining as our, our normal school systems that we don't raise false hope with, with kids as to how much they'll be heard. Can I say something about that everyone being heard bit? Um, some people who haven't tried this worry that if you have a class of 30, as most of our schools have, um, that you're going to have to listen to 30 views every time you make any decision. And in fact, it's it's not like that at all. Um, one of the things uh, that has 
in in the psychology journals will, will, you'll find is that when when young people believe that decisions such as disciplinary decisions in school are made by people like them they are more likely to adhere to them and respect those rules than if the rules are made by people not like them so if you even have a representative whatever that means group of young people involved in curriculum design or in deciding on uh, discipline in the school the, the the youngsters knowing that happens will be more accepting of it so having a voice is is important and, and what um what the teachers in my research found was that it wasn't the loud confident children who dominated the classroom when they in involved the pupils in collaborative decision making it was the opposite they started to hear voices they'd never heard before because those people who won't speak up when the question is something like what's the capital of france or what does anyone know about pomegranates um th those people who are not sure they know the real answer or maybe haven't got as the same sort of home background information source remain silent but if they ask some questions like have you ever felt afraid or um have you ever had to change your mind about something uh, or has, has have you ever felt like a decision was made that you weren't asked about people start talking out and have a voice that is strong and and surprising and i i'd also like Absolutely. to say that it's not just the younger teachers. I have found there are some very well-established teachers who keep what they do in their classroom secret because they don't know if it's going to be approved of. And when I start talking about this, they kind of go, Georgie, that's what I do. But I didn't know it had a name. I didn't know it was a thing. It was just <laughs> something I did and didn't know if I should talk about it or not. And that was the same as the participants in the research kept saying, I don't know why you're interested in us. Is it a thing? Yeah. That's so beautiful. I mean, Joe, one of the magic things for me doing this kind of work in three schools over 20 years is watching kids who at the beginning are not the ones who push themselves forward to be class secretary or class chair over a period of time, willingly taking on the job. And their parents saying to me, I just could never have believed that Wendy would be chairing meetings. You know, this is just amazing. And that adults would be asking for permission to speak with Wendy. That's so beautiful. And Geraldine mentions research. I've, I've knocked up a quick list of seven bits of research. I know, Joe, you had a little bit of stick from some people who said, what research? As if there wasn't any to support the kinds of things we're talking about. And there's masses of it. And I've knocked up a quick list with seven of the perhaps pieces that would, um, for example, Mager and Kovac, it's 3,200 studies they looked at. So there's masses here. And I was just wondering if I could put my email address up on the screen if anyone's interested in, in this research. I'll send them a copy. <coughs> That's derryhannam, derry.hannam245 at gmail.com. I'll happily send it to anyone who's interested. I'll um, put it in the comments at the end as well, Derry. Okay. I would like to comment on, yes, I, I totally agree that it's important to build on this, um, this culture that uh, we need to have the same rights with the kids. Still, I feel that as adults, we also need to keep in mind that we kind of act in a way sometimes we don't have to because it comes naturally from them but we sometimes need to act as a common sense voice in order to ensure that functional limits can actually work out uh, I, i'm not going to start <laughs> telling you about the examples that we have had but it has involved many different things from uh, um, you know the sodas for seven year olds uh, which, which are like really high caffeine based uh, and, and we have had to say wait a moment there are some issues that we cannot really and we explain and we talk and we get into the questions that with them of 
why this is what it, what is this doing to your body how can we actually find some substitutes together maybe we can build this together or you know something a bit healthier so i i do believe that our role there needs to be not major but it needs to be important as well uh, we don't need to be in the in the front line but we need to help them stand and start asking those questions that perhaps because we have more experience we could also ask at once um, trying to answer a bit about the question about sociocracy um, there are different circles um, different uh, kind of clubs or activities or interests have those circles instead of majority rule in which the minority just needs to shut up and try to find better arguments and you know maybe not be listened to in sociocracy the idea is to get to consent so every person in the circle of sociocracy has um, um, a saying on the topic that is being discussed the idea is not to get to consensus everybody agrees with but to get to consent for instance i um i i don't feel that this is going over anybody's rights or my own rights i feel that could happen um and i'm not opposing it so in the end it is reaching avoiding the idea of having a minority that might become bitter about the decision making based on majorities um and also involving everybody into considering how this aspect uh, affects them or not uh, i find it very difficult especially if the schools are big or if the the the, the institution the organization the social group is big but it is very manageable when we have smaller groups of people and we can listen to each other you can say i pass i don't have anything to say about that right i'm okay with the decision but it's important everybody has that possibility of expressing how they're feeling about it yeah there, there is a lot of work on, on sociocracy in the netherlands especially the first one was the workplatz if i'm not mistaken and there is a book by plesman in the 60s who was a student of that school, the work plus, the work plats, the workshop is, is the name in Dutch. By Kay Spooker. Okay, yes, they, they were, uh, uh, they were not Mormons, they were uh, Quakers. I think they were the first who started approaching this, this situation. Let's bring kids into the decision making. Mm. Yeah. His name was Kay Spooker, Charlie. You probably Kay Spooker, yeah. yeah. Thank you. There's one. Oh, sorry, Richard, go on. Uh, just adding to the, the whole uh, comments here about youth empowerment and a little story from my own experience. Those those children that may be quiet or not not involved in how they come to shine in a, a democratic type of environment where they feel appreciated. I had uh, this one Vietnamese boy in one of my classes. Uh, he was in the process of learning English. He was um, absolutely miserable in there it was a traditional type class and and uh, i was teaching it traditionally at the time and uh, the next year though uh, he joined up for the the program that i described and uh, in in just three weeks he went from being this this miserable unhappy boy to just beaming he had found friends in there he had the freedom to to talk with people feeling trusted it wasn't 30 eyes turning to look at him if he talked in the classroom. It was just just jabbering with, with other kids. And uh, towards the end of the program, uh, he came to me and asked if, if he could uh, arrange for the, the uh, class Christmas party. So he went from being this miserable recluse to being the, the classroom social director because he was working within a, a, an environment of trust. And he just shone there. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you, Richard. There's a really good question, actually, that's just come up in the comments. It says, do you ever think that the limits on democracy in schools, for example, the mandatory nature of school, the mandatory curriculum, the mandatory exams, limit how far it will spread into changing society? I'm asking as an unschooler who sees having fundamental choices taken away from us as a major cause for our passive, disengaged society. Mei Ling. And of course, she's right. Um, but one of the encouraging things is uh, the EDGE Foundation ran a session a few days ago where they had, I think, representatives from six or seven different commissions looking at the examination, assessment and testing processes 
that are doing so much harm in England. And you do, one hopes when enough people, enough, near enough to seats of power, start taking these issues seriously, um, we might get some change. Incidentally, one of the kids who wrote half a chapter in my book, his parents said to me, oh, he's at secondary modern school, so there's no chance of him going to university. He did end up going to university. And one of the things he was passionate about in the class was geography projects. He loved transport systems and drawing maps of canals and railways. His parents didn't believe me when I said when he was 12, that one day he'll get a geography degree. And he did, and he went on to become principal of a primary school years later, encouraging student participation. So one hopes, you know, that uh, it's not all a complete waste of time. He's just retired, actually. I recommend his chapter in the book. I, I, I never get tired. I definitely agree with, with uh, the, the question. Uh, question slash, slash statement. I never get tired of, of uh, pointing out Melton, von Mental, Melton's uh, book about uh, instruction and um, absolutism in Prussia and Austria. Uh, this is a historian of education. He found the records of, uh, you know, Frederick II giving the, the task around the early 18th century, giving the task to a military priest uh, to organize a system to make sure that uh, in society there will be discipline and obedient soldiers and citizens. This was Prussia, okay, similar to any militaristic state. What this military priest came out with was a division of ages, separating kids according to their age, organizing the day in blocks according to disciplines, and a really strong hierarchy of adult of authoritarianism, making sure that assessment was according to the curriculum and the timetable would fit and would be the same for everybody. We continue with this. This is a fetish. This was not developed during the Industrial Revolution, as we have been told. This was developed earlier. And the idea is to keep the status quo going on, not to change it, not to question it, just to be a good aunt within the system. Now, we have different challenges nowadays. And we will have we we'll continue having different challenges. One of them is employability. What do our people do then if they are not able to think by themselves? Our young people. How can they actually, you know, job, getting a job is dignifying. When we get jobless people, when we get this situation that we have nowadays in many countries around the world, young people who don't study and don't uh, work, why is it for? We don't ask these questions. We individualize the responsibilities. This has to do with a, a, a lack of, uh, uh, you know, this powerlessness that is, is spreading around our kids. And it also has to do with political indifference. So I definitely think that we need to start reconsidering how we are just making this fetish move on and continue. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Geraldine, you were first. <laughs> yes, I, I agree with the the, um, the comments that there are limits um, in the culture and schools, but we're nowhere near those limits. It's like we are playing in a um, a fifty hectare field, and we only are playing within five square meters of it. We we need to go. We need to go to the boundaries first before we start complaining of that. There's many opportunities still in the conventional system. To, to work much closer to this this way without being the the, the bigger um, limits uh, crushing us there, there is a lot more room for, for development right now <laughs> Derry <laughs> I've just comment following on from that and from Paula's Paula's comment in the chat about the hypocrisy of things like the rights respecting schools movement whereas when you actually look at what's going on in some of those schools nothing much has changed and it's a pr exercise that's not entirely true because there's been some pretty good research from brighton and sussex universities into the rights respecting schools um but it is certainly um 
certainly a danger. One of the things that hasn't been mentioned is sometimes I was criticised, oh, you work with those kids from when they were 11 to 13, but then they go back into ordinary schooling and it's a waste of time. Um, this just isn't true. One of the bits of research I mentioned in the, in the list is the high scope study by Lawrence Schweinhardt. Um, 40 years ago, some the early years kids, some went into authoritarian environments, some went into laissez-faire environments, and some went into democratic participative environments. And those kids have been followed and the, 40 years since they had that experience as their early years experience. And the results are quite extraordinary. I would really would recommend it. The lifelong benefits that are being observed in the high scope 40 year study. Richard. The, the question, Joel, that came up earlier about uh, changing our, our culture generally uh, can we do that with our, our school system? It, it brings to mind the uh, the film that, that Carol Black did, Schooling the World, and the, the comment in particular that if you want to, to change a culture, she says in a single generation, you have to change how you uh, educate its children or how its children get an education. And uh, Derry pointed out in, in a, a talk to UNESCO's um, new futures of education report that uh, you, you can't raise kids in an autocratic system for 18 years and expect them to come out as anything but people who have to wait to be told what to do who are apathetic about their vote and so our, our schools we we have to assume the the corollary there is uh to uh, if you want to change the culture you have to change how you educate the children, the corollary to it is that that we have the culture that we do because of our school system. And we've got to get over that, this undemocratic way that, that we're living. We get 40% of people in Ottawa turning out to vote for school board elections. And a lot of evidence that those voting have very little idea of who they're voting for. This to me is, is um, a real, indication of a, a democracy that, that needs to be renewed and i think we need and we're seeing it with world events right now uh, for us all who believe in democracy to really get out into our communities and start talking about uh, renewing our our democracies and that means renewing how we we handle democracy in our schools there's um, a good book an, an event going on right now, actually, parallel to this uh, by John Wall. Uh, the book is called uh, Give Children the Vote, and it's on democratizing democracy. Uh, very relevant at this time. So uh, a couple of comments there. The, the person who asked the question, I didn't realize I could see the comments, and so I've been working a little blind here, but that idea about taking my kid out of schools and um, and how do we create the the society that we want uh, that that question is bang on and, and it's not with the kinds of school that we have right now so true charlie um, did you say something just really briefly i feel that yes of course we need to work with young people on on, on building this this new future the different kind of future not the repetition of what we have been living through but at the same time, we need to work also with the families. There are many parents who, uh, uh, you know, need support, need to uh, think together, need to understand also that, that or, or to realize that other parents have similar challenges. And how can we together build on this network of support and start finding solutions? Uh, we have, for instance, some work with a, with a therapist who is specialized in trauma, and she is supporting us for free totally because she identifies with the project and we are meeting with parents and we are sharing our concerns and we are developing strategies on how to solve our uh, the, the challenges that we see our kids are going through or how to address those how to give support to the kids because something that maybe we don't know so i feel that, that you know we, we cannot uh, we need to also stop 
um, uh, this mindset that the school deals only with the children and rather the school needs to be a gate for a wider social change, um, how to involve them into you know, any kind of different uh, social initiatives. I think that, that's something that I would like to, to share. No, thank you. Joe, this is subject for your next event, how schools can become community learning centers. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we've run out of time, guys. I'm really sorry. But that was amazing. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, absolute honor to have you all here in one place. Um, and thank you to everyone that's watching. I hope you've enjoyed it and found it useful. So, oh, and I'll be in touch. So tomorrow I'm going to be um, announcing some more events coming up in the group. We've got a series of five more events planned. They're going to be every two weeks on a Thursday starting in two weeks' time. So watch this space. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you very you. much, Joe.